I shared with you last time that I started to hear the sound coming out of my chest, I am, when I would meditate. And it was loud. And I, th I knew that I am not God. So I said, well, God is really trying to get my attention here. He's, and it really scared me because I'm an intellectual. So I really liked my science. And I liked being able to explain everything. And there's no explanation when you know, loud sounds come out of your chest. And, and my then husband, who was also scientifically minded, said, just ignore that. That's nothing you need to, <laughs> you're gonna hurt yourself, stop that. <laughs> so, but, but I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. Because, and that's true for all of you. That, you know, you're here as the light of God. So there is nothing that's gonna separate you from that voice. You know, and it may take you 20 years, and it doesn't matter how long it takes you because there's no time and spirit anyway. But if you're here today, you're definitely somebody who wants to answer that call within. Because when you do, you fulfill your divine destiny, and that's the whole reason why we're on this planet. Doing that is bliss. And, you know, for me, when I was 12 and I, I had delivered that baby and I had that spiritual experience as I was delivering her, I talked a little bit about it last time, but basically what happened is I witnessed the whole event without any pain, without any sadness, with a really clear understanding, even though I was 12, that this is not real. That everything happening here is for me to be loved and to teach love. And in fact, the message of the second gate is I am loved. Is anybody familiar with the Song of Songs in the Old Testament? So the, the passage there, it's, it's kind of long, but the thing that really strikes is, is, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. And a lot of times when people read that, they think it's a romantic statement and it actually isn't. It's talking about the beloved within us, right? That God presence within us is the beloved. And when we become aware of that as we move through our lives, that there's that constant presence of love within us, that no matter what happens, we belong. And so that's what touched me really deeply at 12, is I could see these you know, people in their early 40s who were, who were my earthly parents really struggling and so sad and making decisions that were so tragic, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And so I share that with you because no matter what's going on in your life right now, there is a really important reason for it. And the reason is to move you closer to that God presence. There, there's no question. And I saw a patient today. I absolutely love him. He's an MD. He's from a foreign country. And he, he and his wife were raised in a communist country without any exposure to religion. So um, the tradition of his country would have been Buddhism, but they didn't follow that because it was communist. So when he became very ill himself, he was very fascinated to know what spiritual practice I had. And, and that commonly comes up. They've done statistics, and most patients actually do talk to their doctors about God, even if the doctor isn't open about it like I am. So he asked me, and I said, you know, you, you will find your path. That path is in you. You survived this incredibly severe illness, and you came out smelling like a rose. You are going to, your path is in you. And so he, he stayed with it. And it's so wonderful to see that he's many years now post-kidney transplant. He's thriving in every way. And he does have a spiritual practice, and he, he um, you know, follows Buddhism. And actually, he found out later from his mom, who's pre-communist China, that that's her practice. They always had an altar in the house. They always had a little Buddha. They always had incense burning. But they didn't make an association for their children what that meant, because communism oppressed that. So even if you weren't raised in a particular tradition, you are your tradition. You know, that presence is in you. It's going to guide you. And that's what your body's for. Your body will speak to you about where you need to look and what you need to pay attention to. And the meaning of it, you don't necessarily have to understand. 
the important part is be mindful. Do you know, do you know what that, that means to be mindful? Just pay attention. Remember we said earlier that healing happens through intention and attention? So when you pay attention and be an observer of what's happening around you, healing happens naturally, right? So what does the word grace mean to you? Will anybody give me their definition of grace? Perfect. It's an unmerited gift, meaning that grace comes without you having to work for it. So in, in the gate of belonging, it's a really important concept to learn because it's the place of grace. For any of you that were raised Catholic, there's a beautiful prayer to Mary, and it's Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's really a symbolic prayer. Even if you're not Catholic, the womb of everybody, the pelvis of everybody, the ancestry of everybody is light. We, we are all light, and we are all, because of that light, full of, full of grace. So meaning we don't have to work to become kings and queens. We already are. We were born to be sovereign over our life. We were born to not be controlled. We were born to be free. And yet most of us don't live like that. And um, it's, it's a hard concept to get. It was extremely hard for me, like I said, because I had a martyr complex. <laughs> so I thought I had to be controlled. You know, first, first I was controlled by my parents, then I married a spouse that um, was very controlling. But again, I was very controlling too because I needed to be controlled. So one of the issues that comes up when you're healing the second gate is power control issues, money issues are all centered in the second gate, right? Um, a lot of people attribute that to the first gate, but it really is a second gate issue because money is supply. And if, if your supply is blocked, what's really blocked is grace, because supply is God. God provides everything. And when I say God, I mean the universal energy. Every religion you know, classifies God in a different way. For me, God is universal supply of everything, of health, of wealth, of peace, of joy, of grace. So think about what grace means to you, because it's, it's a word that is just, I think, so descriptive of what bliss really is. And can you imagine what our lives are like when we don't worry about how we're going to pay the rent or how we're going to get our kids through college? I think that the gift of my life has definitely been just this huge infusion of grace at 12. I had no idea what had happened to me. It just got blanked out of my memory. But from that moment forward, I had this strange ability to trust in things that those around me couldn't trust. And it wasn't because of anything I did, <laughs> believe me. I, like I said, was clueless, and my memory was wiped clean for 25 years. So I, I couldn't have made it happen. So that's an example of, and we hear this all the time, right? We see miraculous things happening to people and children, you know, doing amazing things and men or women lifting cars up to save their children, you know, when they weigh two tons or, you know, what, why does this happen? I guess because, again, I have that intellectual mind, I need to have an explanation. And to me, the explanation is grace, you know, and in this world, like, like I was describing from, from that science and non-duality conference, these are people that are very intellectual and scientific. They believe you cannot separate science from spirituality. It's the same thing. And I, and I really do believe that. Because when you look at science, all these things that we study so in depth, guess what we find out? They're not true anyway. Right? So, so all those hours I poured over all those books in medical school, residency, I laugh now when I do my continuing ed, which I, I do, you know, 50 to 100 hours a year of continuing ed, and I, I don't take notes. I could just sit there in a relaxed way and listen to the data, knowing full well 
that it's all going to be changing. And what is never going to change? What's the changeless? Your spirit. So that's the part of you that's always healing. Always healing you. Always supplying you. Always helping you to understand. Do you ever, do you ever notice that when you have a problem or a concern and you go to bed, you sleep on it, and you wake up in the morning and there's your answer? Do, do any of you ever have that happen? And yet the night before you were trying and trying and trying to figure it out and you couldn't? So to me, that's an example of grace, right? Because with grace, what we find out is detachment is really important, being able to detach from the outcome of things. Remember when we talked about those five steps last time? Ask, believe, witness, surrender, receive. Those are the steps we go through as we're setting our intentions and sharpening our attention for our life. You, you have to ask the question first. You may not get the answer right away, but you have to believe that the answer is there. And grace teaches us to believe. But belief isn't enough, right? Because belief can cut love out of the equation. You can believe in something. You can, for instance, I, I think in most religions you have believers. But among those believers, you still see a lot of dysfunction and tragedy and different things going on. And a lot of people have trouble putting that belief into practice. Well, love is the verb. Love is what helps you put into, into practice. Grace is the thing that's always moving and shifting you and changing you and helping you receive that which is already there. So the second gate teaches us that we're already exactly where we need to be. Everything that we're born with is exactly what we need to, the, to move to the next level of our soul expansion, the next level of our spiritual understanding. So I think it's also important to say that when you have children, they definitely come to you teaching you exactly what you need to learn. For any of you that are parents, I, I, I remember when my children came, my third and fourth children are adopted from Korea. And when they came, I, I held my son, he was four months old, and in, when you get do a Korean adoption with this particular agency, uh, which is now closed, but it was called Love the Children, and they have an American GI bring the baby over. So the GI had taken really good care of my baby, and you know he still had the bottle and everything. So I, I took Grant in my arms and I started feeding him. And I just started getting all this information about him just by holding him. Again, I didn't know what was happening. I was 32. And like I said, I really wasn't very savvy about spiritual things, but I knew that everything I was hearing in my heart about him was true. And it was preparing me. It was, it was God preparing me to take care of him. And one of the things he told me is that this, you know, this baby is going to have trouble with alcoholism someday, and you, you're going to be there to support him. And sure enough, when he was 13, he started raiding my cabinets for liquor. And that came to my mind, that I've, I've got to watch him for this, right? So it's our children guide us to learn exactly what we need to learn about ourselves. In retrospect, when I look at that, you know, my, my, there's a long family history of alcoholism in my family on both sides. Grant is not my biology, but he came to me with a gift. And the gift was, Mom, you can transcend this experience with me. Right, because anything we do for anyone else, we're really doing for ourselves, aren't we? So anything we learn about for someone else, we learn about for ourselves. The reason why I bring that up is there really is no such thing as a martyr. You really don't need to take anything on. When Grant first started really getting into alcohol issues and he was getting arrested with DUIs, I knew that I hadn't cleared yet my 
my attachment to my father's wound, who, who was, who, who had issues with alcohol. It, it's, I think that unconsciously I still put too much importance on how that had affected my life. Instead of understanding that all these years I've been in medicine, I am a really powerful listener to people that have substance abuse and alcohol issues. So that's the gift, right? That, that woundedness, or what appeared to be woundedness, ended up becoming one of my greatest gifts of grace. So that's why, you know, when you look at your life, look at it in terms of what grace are you receiving today? Even if it's something that's really disturbing. So I'll give you an example. I, I try to be really organized when I come to Rochester because there's a lot to do. I'm seeing patients and giving a seminar. So we packed six boxes to get here um, with priority mail, three-day mail, 11 days ago. When I got here, only one had arrived, and it was the least important box. The other six, I, we tracked them, and they were apparently in Oakland, which is about 45 minutes from where I live in California. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay. So they had no explanation, you know, and it's Christmas time, and the weather's bad. That ended up being the explanation. Well, today, most of those boxes arrived, except for one, like I said, but looking at that in retrospect, I was driving here and I was having a conversation with God. Why did the one box I need for the seminar not arrive? And I always hear this. Whenever I ask this question, this answer comes to me constantly. Trust me. Trust me. Right? So oftentimes we have no idea why things happen. Right? I mean, if you, you could drive yourself crazy trying to figure out why things happen. What a martyr does is they blame themselves. Well, I should have sent it FedEx, or I should have sent it UPS. I should have sent it three weeks ago instead of 11 days ago. You could really drive yourself crazy, but again, that falls into guilt and punishment. The site, martyrdom is about guilt and punishment. Kings and queens really live by grace, right? So they call Mary, the Divine Mother, the Queen of Peace. She obviously lived by grace. She knew, you know, right from the beginning that she was going to lose her son. And she moved through her life by grace anyway. And the same was true, really, of, of all spiritual masters. They often knew ahead of time what their fate would be but you move through it anyway, and so do all of you. Each and every one of you have a story, and in that story, you've made a choice of whether to carry on or end it right there, right? And I don't mean take your life, but when you stop dreaming, you basically stop living. And gate two is the gate of dreaming. In order to create, you have to be a dreamer. So I shared with you that there was a lot of abuse in my childhood, and um, one of my fond memories of my childhood is what a dreamer I was, and I still am. And I would sit in elementary school, and the teacher would be talking, and I wouldn't pay any attention. I'd be looking out the window at the beautiful green grass, <laughs> the bunnies hopping through, whatever I wasn't supposed to, I, They probably would have labeled me ADD back in the day. As soon as the teacher was done, because I obviously, I think I, when I look at it in retrospect, I needed personal attention, I would go up to her and I'd say, Mrs. Dutcher, what did you just explain <laughs> to the other children? <laughs> and she'd say, oh, well, this is what we're doing today and this is what you need to do. And of course it appeared on the, what do you call those, parent-teacher conferences. Um, you know, she asked for directions after I stated everything I, I, I'd been saying. but. So my mother, I remember my mother saying to Mrs. Dutcher, well, Melanie is a dreamer. And then when we went home, I remember having this long conversation with her, Melanie, you shouldn't be a dreamer. You have to pay attention in class. And I was a compliant child. I was a people pleaser. So I remember I stopped daydreaming in class because I had to do that. I had to make good grades. My mommy said so. 
But that tendency never stopped with me. Even in medical school, they had note-taking services, so I would never take notes. I would just collect the notes after class when I did go, <laughs> which wasn't, which the first year wasn't often because it was so boring. But you know, being a dreamer, when you stop dreaming, you stop living. I don't care how old you are, or how young you are, you want to continue to dream. That's how you change your life. Remember we said that, that spirit is, is the transformer. You are the one that's constantly being transformed. When you connect with that presence within you, your spirit, you will be transformed. And, you know, I've had evidence of this all through my life and all through my career. When we teach someone to meditate, no matter what their diagnosis is, they move through it. I don't care how grave, it's so fun for me to have a patient go to a practitioner that says, you are going to be dying in six months. It's going to be curtains for you. And then teaching them to connect to that presence. And when they really connect to it, that never, that never happens in a way differently than they want it to happen. Some people just make the choice, I'm going to exit now. And they do. But your diagnosis really doesn't matter. Remember, it's just a label. And you can label the body, and you can label a role that you're playing, but you can't label spirit. Spirit is untouchable. In the Bhagavad Gita, it says that you can't wet it, you can't burn it, you can't dry it. You can't do anything to spirit. Spirit is protected and perfect. And that is in you. That perfect spirit is in you. 